Hello and welcome to Statistically Insignificant, a podcast with slides about statistics and how they can be used to fight back against the man. I'm here at the riot, holding a sign with a completely unintelligible jumble of maths on it. My name is Tess, my pronouns are she and they, and I will be your statistics caucus representative. Scowling down from the podium and holding a megaphone with a flat battery, it's Bart. How's it going, Bart? I'm doing well. Um, my pronouns are he and him, and uh, since the last episode, I um, have realised that you can really use moderate to mean anything, so I've been tinkering around, <laughs> tinkering around with some theory, and I've come up with uh, the little moderate book Oh dear! and the Maoist moderate line. <laughs> We'll see how that goes in the future. <laughs> mm, I see, I see. Behind Bart, we have two guests who are shuffling their notes and getting ready to speak. Final year engineering student and National Secretary of the Australian Unemployed Workers Union, Daniel Levy, and David O'Halloran from the School of Primary and Allied Healthcare, Monash University. How's it going? Good, thanks. What? Well, thanks for having us. Yeah, great to uh, meet you, Tess. Great to meet you, Bart. And uh, excited to be here. Yeah, it's an absolute delight to have you on. Today, we're going to be talking about something the AUWU, AWU, I'm going to say annoyingly, has developed to help people under the boot of Australia's truly horrendous welfare system. First up, Daniel and David, what is the Australian Unemployed Workers Union? Uh, the Australian Unemployed Workers Union is a group of people who have come together um, to organise and campaign for better welfare conditions. We've um, been in existence uh, since 2015, and the, the main uh, thing that we do um, is advocate for people who are currently experiencing problems with the system, uh, which we have found over time to be um, most of them. <laughs> uh, the in privatized employment services system um, makes the lives of job seekers um, quite miserable. And to top it all off, people don't get enough money to live on. So people are punished and immiserated uh, by the system. And our organization exists to do everything we can to change that. How does the Australian welfare system work? We have some international listeners. And how do job service providers fit into that? That's a good question. In terms of how job service providers fit into that, I'll hand over to David for that. But the way people get into it in the first place um, is they have to jump through uh, several hoops and look at the right person on a Tuesday to first get approved for a payment. And what I mean by that is the bureaucracy required to get onto a payment in the first place can be extremely prohibitive. So if you don't have work, um, you don't have a certain level of income, you can apply for JobSeeker, uh, which is the um, sort of main payment people get. Uh, but you'll be excluded if you um, have a partner who earns m more than um, a very small amount of money. You'll be excluded if you have um, more than a few thousand dollars in liquid assets. Uh, they'll actually ask you to burn through that before you even apply for income support. Um, they'll exclude you if um, you don't uh, submit all, all the various forms that they, that they want. They uh, need those forms first. They don't give payment first, check, check forms later. Once you have been granted a payment, depending on uh, which one, uh, you will be placed into one of eight um, different employment services programs. So this could include Job Active, Disability Employment Services, the Community Development Program, um, which is the extremely racist one targeting uh, mainly Indigenous communities. Uh, parents Next, if you already have the full-time job of being a parent, um, you also have to go through the rigmarole of being in, in Parents Next after getting um, the parenting payment, which now no longer exists in perpetuity after your child reaches a certain age. Uh, you just get put onto JobSeeker because apparently you're not a parent anymore. Um, once you get into the employment services system, I think now would be a good time to introduce David to talk a bit about that aspect of it. Thanks. I, I guess we need to go back a couple of steps and just explain that there's a difference between being unemployed and being unemployed and on benefits and Great being point. on yep. benefits because those three things are all slightly different. So when we talk about the unemployed, you know, the general assumption is we're talking about people who are on job seeker payment or some other government payment, but really only about a third of people who are unemployed are on uh, job seeker payment. And I'm just going to interject for one second here to say that there is a further wrinkle, which we talk about in our episode on unemployment statistics, where not having a job is not the same as being unemployed. Correct. And there's a gap there where if you do not have a job, but you are not looking for work, 
for whatever reason, you are not considered unemployed either. Correct. You're not in the labour market. And and I guess that's one of the challenges is that we are only talking about people who are on job seeker payment or some some government payment equivalent. So parenting payment or disability support payment. So payments that have a mutual obligation are the people that we are focused on. We're not actually talking about people who are unemployed. Now, Australia is, is unique in the OECD in that it, in most other countries, services for people who are unemployed, um, who, who want a job, are provided either by the government or a mixture of government and private, um, usually not-for-profit agencies. Australia is unique in that all services are provided by non-government and for-profit services. We have no government providers of services anymore. We haven't had government providers of services since about 2014. So that, that is a change. It used to be a government thing. Yes. So from 1945 until well 2015, the government provided services. The CES shut down uh, roughly about 20 years ago, a bit more than 20 years ago, and the Commonwealth Rehabilitation Service shut down in 2015. So when that finished, that was the end of government providing services. Um, and that is based on the assumption that the government is best placed as a purchaser of services rather than as a provider of services. Now we could go down a rabbit hole talking about whether that's actually a good idea, but given we're talking about statistics, that's probably a conversation for another time and maybe another podcast. Well, I would argue that part of what this survey tool is doing is measuring how ineffective this private system is, but we will get to that. Well, yes, we will. Hopefully we will. Yeah. So one of the things that, um, well, one of the assumptions about having different providers providing services for people who are unemployed um, is that unemployed workers have choice. It also assumes that bad providers will go out of business because people won't choose bad providers and that providers will stay in business because they're providing good services. Now that's the promise of marketizing government services. But as we see in so many other areas where governments um, hand over service delivery to private or not-for-profit organizations, the promise that the consumer is somehow going to drive a, um, a better quality service hasn't stacked up in reality. Mm. Well, it kind of doesn't make sense just in the fact of like that model only theoretically works if you have a lot of uh, competition around sure. um, that, certain that, areas. You're exactly right. That, that model works if you have both choice and competition. Um, and it has to be genuine choice and genuine competition. And in this market, choice is pretty constrained because people don't know who are good providers and who are not good providers. So choice is, is pretty dubious. But also competition is pretty restricted. You know, you might have some competition in, um, say, in a suburban area where there's, say, three or four providers. But if you are in a remote area, you've often got a choice of mm, one. So that's not, that's not competition. So if I am a person either on a disability or, or on one of these payments, let's say I'm on job seeker, so I am recognized as unemployed, I am expected under these mutual obligations, which are basically hoops that you are told to jump through in order to get money, mm. and I have been sent to a particular job service provider, what is my interaction with that job service provider likely to look like? Okay, so there's three things a job provider in theory will do. The first and, and the thing that most unemployed workers assume is that it's there to help them get a job. And if you look at the advertising of most employment providers, that's what they have on the front page of their website. That's what they have in their brochures. We're here to help you get a job. So, so that job matching service is a key part of any employment service. Now, the research I did as for, for my um, PhD was people's experience of that. You know, people went to those providers saying, well, I wanted them to help me get a job. Um, and that didn't really happen. The second thing that a provider 
um, can do is if someone can't get a job just now because you know for some reason they don't match their skills don't match the um, the needs of their local labor market then that second element is about building employability and employability is a pretty generic term which looks at things like you know your ability to get a job so that's things like helping you with your resume or interview skills or accessing this mysterious hidden job market. It might be stuff like looking at your, um, well, for want of a better description, looking at your attitude to the labour market. And a lot of providers will go down the track of saying, you know, the reason why you haven't got a job is your bad attitude, um, which can be pretty difficult for someone. Or the third thing that providers can do to improve employability is things like credentialing or certifica certification. So sending you off to a certificate one course in shelf stacking or um, or the popular one, which is the certificate three in, in aged care, which every, every provider seems to want to send everyone to. Mm. So job service providers will look at first helping you get a job. And the second is to build your employability. But the third function of a job service provider is what they call the work test. Now, in theory, that's to make sure that services are being delivered to people who genuinely are unemployed. And some elements of the work test have been, well, they've been around for more than a century. But the work test has become more and more onerous over the last, particularly the last 20 years. And some would argue that job service providers almost exclusively are now focused on the work test to the exclusion of helping people find a job and building their employability. And certainly when you speak to unemployed workers, the thing that they're talking about most is all the hoops that they have to jump through, which is what Daniel's just been talking about. You know, are you genuinely unemployed? And maybe let's just increase the threat effect of, of proving that so that we're not um, we're not wasting money you know our valuable taxpayers money on on things like you know lurid welfare cheats or or something like that <laughs> uh, so, yes that so, that excessive lifestyle on 250 dollars a week absolutely yes yes, yes. So, so you know and you just have to look at the media to see how frequently welfare cheats are paraded in front of the um in front of the media, you know, there'll be often, you know, most weeks there's someone who's either been sent to jail or so forth for defrauding the taxpayer um, because they're a welfare cheat. Um, welfare cheat or welfare dependent has kind of become the new um, speak for what used to be called doll bludgers. Mm. There, there's a bit of a conflict here. So on the one hand, these first two are nominally on paper, let's let's be very clear about that, about helping people. Whereas this third one is very much about using these private providers as kind of a, an arm of the state policing the boundaries of who gets access to state that, support. That's and state exactly money. right. Now, now those three functions are, are not illegitimate in any way. The problem is those three functions have to be in balance. Um, and, you know, the AUWU would argue that that these three functions are absolutely not in balance. Most uh, unemployed workers find that um, employment, the experience of going to an employment service provider is often useless and sometimes harmful, which doesn't seem to be fitting with those first two objectives of helping find people find a job or, or building people's employability. It's, it's basically about the work test. And also, um, just in terms of like the philosophy of the um, activism of the AUWU, regardless of what the policy settings are um, and what they should be, no policy settings should be doing what they are currently doing, which is bullying and immiserating people. Hmm. So there's often, you know, extensive arguments about what should the policy be. And the, the main thing that we're doing here is saying no matter what the policy settings are, it shouldn't be infringing the rights and dignity of unemployed workers. 
Well, there's another like political aspect to this, which is that what role does this play in the context of a capitalist market? So all of this, all of this framing is very much positioning un being unemployed as a problem with the in individual, as opposed to a structural aspect of the way that the job market is constructed, where you require the presence of a body, a pool of unused labour, let's say, usually in the form of unemployed people, in order to apply downward pressure on wages and to have like the ability to have some liquidity, if you will, in the labour market. So you have like a pool of people who can move into jobs that have become vacant or um, be there as people for, like come out of other jobs. And that is a structural decision to yes. make, whereas the welfare state as it exists pretends that this is an individual problem. That's precisely right. That's the contradiction in terms, which is that there is the non-accelerating inflation rate of unemployment, which necessitates that there is always unemployed people, and to then subject them to this system is just cruel and inhumane. And then in, in terms of the, the structural nature of should there be employment, should there be unemployment, no, no matter what, it, it shouldn't be whatever this is. Yeah, sure. The other thing, I guess, with this is that even the language that government uses here is quite telling. So... In the olden days, if you didn't have a job, you were called an unemployed worker, and that lasted right up until about the 1960s. And then sometime in the 70s, early 80s, people became job seekers. And that language is important because it changes the responsibility from unemployment being a structural problem to unemployment being an individual problem. And the underlying message by being a job seeker, is that your unemployment is ultimately your fault. Yeah. Which is why the Australian Unemployed Workers Union uses the term unemployed worker, because it's a constant reminder that unemployment is also a structural problem. This is how the labour market is set up. And it, you kind of need to, I say you kind of need to, That that's a horrible way of putting it, but <laughs> to be able to bully workers on the like employed workers on the lower rungs of it, you kind of need to make it a horrible experience for unemployed workers. Well, yes, and that is part of that, what we've talked about before, the work test. You know, there there is the threat effect of the work of work test. And, and governments are, are not, they don't hide that fact. The, the threat effect appears in, in official documents, but that is a balance and the balance is completely tipped to services focusing on the work test only to almost the complete exclusion of helping people find a job and building people's employability. Most of the unemployed workers we speak to say that these two things just don't happen. There's two actually two different things going on there. So on the level of people who are currently employed, the function of the welfare state and the function of these job service providers is coercive to them to accept worse conditions in their work because exactly. it could be worse. They could be on, on unemployment services and having to put up with this. Among unemployed people, there's also that level of threat where if they don't jump through the right hoops, if they aren't sufficiently deferential to the people in these job service providers, then they will be thrust even further into poverty by being cut off from access to the welfare. Sure. And we know about a third of people who are classified as unemployed by the Australian Bureau of Statistics are not on any payment at all. So some of those are not on any payment at all because they're um, on their spouse's or partner's payment or their parent's um, income. But some are simply just not. They look at the system and think, mm, thanks, that's not for me. I'm not going down that track. And those people are then, therefore, really vulnerable to exploitation by the labour market. I wanted to ask a question about the building employability part of this. Sure. So there are kind of useful qualifications that you can have to get a job. Like uh, when I had a construction white card, for example, mm -hmm. that was really useful to me. Yes. Would getting that course be covered by the state or would you have to pay for it? Out I, I have a, a really um, sad example of exactly the white oh, card no. issue. Yeah. Um, one of our, so I've uh, for a, a little while now been the coordinator of the Canberra branch of the Australian Unemployed Workers Union. And one of our members reported to us that their work for the doll site. So work for the doll is one of um, the most evil parts of this system people are paid um, 40 cents an hour, which all of these work for the doll operators um, 
have to submit uh, to the modern slavery register to argue why what they're doing isn't actually slavery, <laughs> um, which is Funny just that. a real statement on the entire system. But one of our members talked about how uh, they were directed to go to a work for the doll site where they had to um, do intense construction work to the point that they needed to get white card training. So they got the white card training. They were then paid 40 cents an hour to do white card construction work. And then at the end, they weren't given their white cards. They weren't given the qualification that would then let them do oh, that skill that they'd learned else where, which really goes to show you just how baked into the system the exploitation is. Because if you were really trying to build a system that gave people extra or, or gained employability, you would be singing about getting them the white card um, qualification, except it was deliberately held back once they'd finished. Yeah. And, and we, you know, are reaching out at the moment to the various unions where this massively undermines wages, because why on earth would you pay a union um, paid job with benefits and, and rights and organizing, if you could pay 40 cents an hour, or in most of these work for the doll sites, they actually get paid by the government to do this. They get um, completely subsidized free labor, which massively undermines the wages of everyone else. And yes, at the very end, the people who have now finished that work for the doll site get to be told again that they're underqualified, that they've got to do more punitive mutual obligations to upskill and get into the next job. <laughs> I have said, and I think um, it is very much true, Kafka would struggle to imagine a more <laughs> um, labyrinthine and evil bureaucracy than this one. I think one of the interesting things about Work for the Doll, and it's a nice example about how the language of Work for the Doll is all around building employability. If you look at the sort of promotion of Work for the Doll, it's things like building positive attitudes, building work skills and so forth. Now that's that's the language of work for the doll. So it, it in theory it fits very much under that building employability framework. The actual practice of work for the doll is very much in that third category of work test in that the experience is frequently so unpleasant that it becomes again part of that threat effect of the work test you know if you want to stay on the doll we're going to make it really unpleasant for you do correct me if i'm wrong on this that happens because if you don't complete the required number of hours on this work for the doll you will be kicked off with the payment that's right now the other thing about the threat effect is it kind of it, it, there's a language there that also says, well, that's your choice. You know, you can choose to take the benefit or you can choose not to take benefit and then you don't have to do any of these horrible things. Now, that also assumes that if you've got no money, you've got some choice. Now, that's not actually what happens in real life. If you have no money, you don't really have the choice of saying, oh, no, thanks, I'm good, thanks. Um, I'll be okay. Within this system, what led you to the decision to set up the survey tool and then the ranking tool that has come out of that? So the, the tool itself was an extension of David's long research, which I'll now get David to um, talk about. The tool the tool came after what David will now explain. Okay, so so when I my PhD was about people's experience of employment services and and as I mentioned before, the the basic finding was that employment services are mostly useless and sometimes harmful for most people. Now, I wasn't happy to just stop there and say, well, okay, that's it. Thanks for coming. We wanted to actually see, or I wanted to see, well, what could we do about that? Now, going back to what we were talking about before, if we assume that employment services are going to be a genuine market where there's choice and competition, that requires unemployed workers to have choice and competition. Now, the market is not a place of choice and competition because people don't know what their providers are like. Um, I've been a volunteer on the Unemployed Workers Union hotline for probably nearly a decade now. Um, and people often ring and say, can you recommend a better provider? Um, and the short answer is, well, no, I can't. So it was partly to address that perceived need that, that the consumer, in this case, the unemployed worker, wanted mar genuine market information about government services um, that they were, were obliged to use. Now, in theory, the government has a thing called the star rating system, which is a complex algorithm of 
employment outcomes by each provider. So each provider gets um, rated on the number of people they get into work. Now the problem with um, any any rating system is that it very rapidly becomes gamified. Yeah. So so uh, it didn't take long for providers to work out how to get um, how to maximise their star ratings, um, and we see um, behaviours that we call parking and creaming. Mm. So what parking and creaming are about is a provider says, well, if I'm going to get brownie points for getting people into jobs, I'm going to go through my caseload and work out who I'm, who's most likely to get a job with the least amount of effort, that is the cream, um, and who is going to take too much effort, too much time to get into a job. They're the parked. So parking and creaming are natural consequences of any, any um, system like this. Um, so, so the star rating system exists. Most unemployed workers don't even know it exists, and, and the ones that do know it exists are very, um, shall we say, sceptical about its, its usefulness. And there's a, there's a lot of literature about why the star rating system hasn't worked. It's interesting to see in the new iteration of employment services coming up next month that the star rating system has been abandoned, and, and that's, that's good. Uh, it, it didn't work. So I wanted to design a consumer rating system that consumers thought was um, useful to them. Now, you could come up with your own rating system on a wet Wednesday afternoon and, and think of things that you think are good, but that's not really, that's not good survey design. Yeah. Fortunately, the AUWU did a, um, a member survey a couple of years ago which asked lots and lots of questions about people's experiences of employment services. Being a bit of a data nerd, I was given the data to, well, to play with. Oh, that's always um, the best fun, isn't it? That's, that's always <laughs> the best fun. <laughs> Recreational data analysis, delightful. Mm, get a life. <laughs> <laughs> I have one. I do a podcast in it. Yes. So, so I played around with that data for a while, looking at People's answers to that. So it was a mixture of Likert type questions, yes, no questions, and lots of open text about people's experience. Mm. And what I was trying to find was what was driving the answers to that survey. Like, you know, are there factors, are there consistent factors underpinning the answers to that survey? And of course, the short answer is yes, there were. Essentially, we started with about 700 odd responses, which is a good size number in terms of of integrity. We then turned those things into, well, essentially turned those answers into numbers to see what things clustered together. Exploratory factor analysis is a, is a way of just looking at playing with data and, and collapsing it into answers that cluster together consistently so that if someone answers questions 1, 5 and 7, you know, a score of a, a similar score, another person's going to answer questions 1, 5 and 7 also with a similar score. So person one might be saying one, five and seven are really, really bad. And person two might be saying one, five and seven are really, really good. What you're looking for is the pattern of how those questions get answered. And, and what you start to see ultimately is some questions get answered in a consistent pattern. And when you see that, you kind of think, aha, we've got a factor here because people who think this is bad generally think that's bad. People who think that's good generally think this is also good. So, so factor analysis just helps you see patterns in responses. Now, some of those are really obvious ones, like well, there was a factor of what, that were called useful, and that was questions around what kinds of things helped you to find a job. Mm. And, you know, generally people answered those questions the same way. If they found something useful, they found other things useful. Yep. We found questions around relationship or friendliness that, that tended to cluster together. So that's a factor we called friendliness. We found stuff that tended to cluster together around being fair. Mm. And so we call that factor fair. Part of factor analysis is also sort of saying, okay, well, what are these questions? You know, what's the common theme? 
with these questions. Now, sometimes it's obvious, like usefulness. All these questions are about doing something useful. Some clusters are a bit trickier to kind of think, well, what's this about? So, for example, we had questions around providers' trustworthiness or integrity, but also stuff around interfacing with the MyGov app and, and the technical aspects. And, and those two things, they consistently clustered together. And you kind of think, how does this kind of work out to be the same thing? When I started looking at the qualitative data, there seemed to be something about people needing to trust in the process. Mm. So we call that, that cluster trustworthiness because it isn't just about... It's not just about providers doing what they say they're going to do, which is what we assume trustworthiness is. It's about having faith in a system. Mm. And providers' behavior obviously is a factor in the faith in the system, but it's also, you know, more broadly, a faith in the system. So, so factor analysis, there is, while there's a very nerdy technical thing about these things have to get together, there's also a bit of an art form in kind of saying, well, these things don't look like they're a, a cluster of anything, but but is there something that maybe does cluster together? And that's where the, the qualitative analysis came in really handy because we were able to sort of say, yes, okay, as people explained it in, in their um, free text, it became much clearer that people were talking about, I need to have faith in, in this system. Mm. So, so that's how you know, factor analysis can work just on the pure numbers, but but it, it's stronger when you've got some qualitative data to, to help you work out what you're looking at. One thing I remember when you were first explaining this to me, because I know about principal factor analysis, because my yeah, background, yeah. principal factor is really good because you want as few variables as possible. But <laughs> when you were explaining to me how exploratory factor analysis worked, or something that really stuck out to me as a good way to think about it was, it's not and correct me if I'm wrong here, this is still just my understanding based on what you explained, but the way I've understood it is it's not that every um, question in that grouping has the same numerical value, say it's out of five, it's not that every single one of them is two out of five, it's that if the average of them is say two or three out of five, and one of them's a two and one of them's a three, if someone, uh, the, the pattern is if someone is, is rating things a bit higher, so say the questions that got an average of two, they rated it a two and a half, you would reasonably expect the three to go up to three and a half for them. That Precisely, kind of yeah. So, so it's, it's the consistency of the way people answer questions is what you're looking for. So, so exploratory factor analysis just is saying, if people are happy about this, this and this, that's going to be consistent, but those same group of things, if someone's unhappy about one, they're likely to be unhappy about the others as well. So so you're looking for a consistent pattern of the way those things are being answered. So specifically, this is a um, quantitative method. A absolutely. But also, you know, my, my background is as a qualitative researcher. So, so you know, I do like playing with numbers, but but I'm happier with qualitative research. So I, I felt more comfortable once I'd done the qualitative research and said, yeah, these things are there. So it was kind of like, you know, normally when you're doing qualitative research, you're wanting the themes to emerge from the data. But I went into that saying, okay, these are my themes. Can I find these things in my in my qualitative data? And absolutely, they were there. So this is one of the interesting things that happens across a whole bunch of um, social research where you see this marrying of the quantitative stuff where you have this system of number-based measurement in your survey responses and your qualitative analysis, which is able to get more access to the underlying kind of incredibly complex and incredibly rich human experience, which Precisely. does not marry itself very well to numbers. So in terms of the, the if you like, the integrity of, of those clusters, I'm quite confident, well, I was quite confident that we had six quite definable characteristics. And then, you know, road testing that with a whole bunch of unemployed workers to sort of say, you know, is this, does this sound right? So that was where we started. So the next step in the process was then to say, all right, we've got our factors. Let's see if if some kind of rating scale exists with any of those factors. And well, the short answer is no, they don't. <laughs> but there are plenty of rating scales, particularly used in the in the health sector, you know, what I call patient experience measures, um, where many of those broad factors are used when people are writing their experience in, in health services, which 
coming from a health service background, I was quite quite familiar with. Mm. So what I did then was look around at all the, well, they're mostly patient experience measures, look at all the, the, the rating scales that use the terms that I had come up with in this employment service to sort of say, well, are there are there better questions than the one we've asked here? So I found about 50 rating scales around the world that had some of the questions that might be relevant. And you know, if I changed some of the wording to make them appropriate for an employment services context, you know, I ended up with a bank of 160 odd questions that explored some of those factors. Now you can't do a survey with 160 questions. Well, no. you can. But, <laughs> it's just, you won't get many responses. But you won't get very many responses. You know, there's, there's, there's sort of a golden number of, uh, of survey questions. And generally, you like to keep survey questions under 40. Mm. If you go over 40, there's sort of a, there's a golden point where it just drops off off a cliff. So you can't have a survey of 180 questions. So so what I did first was got a small group of unemployed workers together, six unemployed workers together, and we worked, got them to work in pairs and say, let's go through each one of these questions and, and just tell me what this question means to you. Um, and you know, if it didn't mean what I thought it was going to mean, then we just got rid of it. So mm. that sort of culled it down to about 140 questions. So then I did another sample survey and asked for some volunteers from the Unemployed Workers Union and said, look, this is a really, really long survey. It's not going to be the final one, but would you mind just humoring me and doing this survey? And what I was looking for is, I suppose, the questions that I used that were came from the original survey, or maybe there were better questions or questions that clustered together more tightly or you know, just better questions. So went through that process. What I found in that process is there were some questions that sort of didn't cluster together as well as I thought they would, so we just got rid of them. Mm. There were questions that what we call cross-loaded. So they're questions that, that load to two separate factors. They're not that useful in survey design because you're wanting each question to kind of load to just one factor alone. Yeah. So we got rid of all the ones that cross-loaded to more than one factor. One of the factors consistently, however, kept on splitting into two factors. And after some sort of thinking about it, I ended up deciding to split that factor into two. That just refined it. I went through and then just said, okay, well, I think we ended up with about 60 questions. That's still too long. Literally went through them question by question, took it out of the survey, did another run through the analysis. And if the whole analysis fell apart, oops, we put that back in <laughs> <Yeah>. and we'll <laughs> take another one out. Finding those single points of failure. Yeah. Yes. So, so literally taking them out question by question until it got down to the magic 40. Is there a research term known as survey Jenga? Because like <laughs> <laughs> there should be. Yes. So, so essentially we got it down to the 40, which then said, you know, this, this survey is now long enough to, to, to put out to, to the general public. What that then does is ask people questions that consistently cluster to each of the factors that we think are important to unemployed workers. I'm just going to interrupt right now and say, let's actually talk through them. Okay. There's one thing I wanted to talk about that's, that's really criti critical here. One of the things that we see in a lot of human services is that human services ask consumers how satisfied you were with the service. And the problem is satisfaction is a really bad measure of human services because it depends on too many things that are outside the control of the provider. Like you're going to be satisfied with your provider if you've got a job. Mm. Now that might not be within the control of your provider. Like the provider might do some really fabulous things or maybe not um, and you don't get a job and your satisfaction is going to depend a lot on what happens. If you think about it in a different context, you might go to stay in a hotel, but the weather's really bad, you have an argument with your partner or something like that. Your satisfaction with that experience is going to be a whole lot lower than if the weather's fabulous and you have a lovely time and it's all romantic and, and so forth. That's got nothing to do with the hotel you stayed in, but your, experience, your, your satisfaction is going to be affected by those other things. 
this is why uh, a lot of KPIs, key performance indicators for a lot of people in their jobs are really, really bad as well. Yes. Same idea. So one of the things that's really important in, in particular, again, coming from the health sector is that you want to measure experience. So precisely what happened and then what did you think of that? I think satisfaction is the wrong consumer measure to use in human services and it's used way too often. You know, measure experience because it's more straightforward. It's pretty practical. The other really good thing about measuring experience is then you can give the feedback to the provider and say, do you know what, if you want to improve your rating, this is something you might like to do, which is one of the features of the rating scale, which is that it's useful not just for unemployed workers to help them work out which is the best provider, but it's also useful for, for, for providers to see where they're falling down in quite explicit practical terms so that if you want to become more useful it might involve doing things like helping people find jobs or helping people with their resume or helping people with interviews or, or, or whatever. So, so it's really important that your rating scale is useful not just for the selection function but also useful for the quality assurance function for providers. There's no point in getting, getting feedback if the provider can't do anything with it. Well, the other thing with that is like um, I give like five stars to every like Uber trip I take or mm -hmm. anything like that just off the basis that, oh, I don't want to get anyone fired. Yes. So if, you, um, if you're in that habit and the government is asking about your job provider and you had an okay time with it, you're probably just going to like out of habit just like say, oh, yeah, it was great. It was fine. Yes. And that's, that's the problem with rating scales that just do blunt star ratings like like with airbnb or uber or whatever you know people just generally put the five stars and then when you look at the comments you think oh actually that doesn't look like it's going to be yeah. a five star <laughs> how, how how would they have given that a five star so so star ratings just on their own are a pretty clunky tool it's actually much better to like we could have just asked people, okay, these are the factors that we think are really important. Give them a rating out of one to five. And, and and that's perfectly legitimate to do that. It just doesn't give people much information. Whereas yeah. going down to the sort of minute detail as this does, it actually then gives information. And it also means that that sort of halo effect of giving people five, five stars when really they deserve two or three is more likely to be driven by practical stuff around what was your experience actually like? There's another thing to this, which is let's um, say that this takes off in a way where this is ubiquitous. A lot of people are using it. I would imagine a lot of these extremely predatory and awful um, agencies will try to force job seekers to give them a positive rating with some inducement in some way. Um, they might even make it implicit much harder to get someone to do it over for a panel of 48 questions and then rather than um go and just give us five stars here yeah yes. for sure and yeah. and what's and and what will be extra interesting is if uh say an agency uh logged on and tried to uh manipulate their data with a whole bunch of outliers that would also stick out like a sore thumb yep so there are yeah there are many many positives to having it be as robust as David has made it. And I guess the other thing is when people actually go onto the rating scale, they can see the responses answer by answer. Yeah. And that kind of protects us a, a bit from the that generic one star, five star sort of thing, which, you know, you look at as the sort of headline thing, and, and that's a perfectly good thing to do, but it allows you to then drill down and sort of say, well... You what's know, actually, actually going on here? Yeah, this, this is what's actually going on here. So actually, now let's talk about the actual yes. what the what the factors are. So you had seven major factors, and uh, we'll just walk through each one, and we'll get a brief description, just briefly. So yeah. the first factor we've labelled that as useful, and that's um, composed of items reflecting practical assistance to get a job or improve one's employability, like we talked about before. You know, employment services are there to help people get a job or improve people's employability. So those two functions of, of employment services. I'm also going to state how many questions there are. So there were eight questions in this factor in the survey instrument. Sure. 
So not surprisingly, this was the most important factor. And I think it's applicable not just to employment services, I actually think it's applicable to lots of other areas of service delivery. Like, you know, you go to your doctor or whatever, you assume that it's going to be useful, but can you say that for sure? So, so usefulness is kind of so obvious, but the problem with something that's really obvious is that you don't actually often make it explicit. So yeah. this is about making something quite obvious, quite explicit. We want employment services to be useful and useful as defined by the consumer. So the second factor, we've, I've labelled that as client-centred, and, and that's composed of items reflecting choice and empowerment. So, so essentially, you know, is the program of service that you're delivering about the unemployed workers' needs, or is it about, you know, one size fits all the services that you want to deliver, which is not always the same thing. Yeah, and there were six questions in this one. Absolutely. Um, the third factor was labelled as fair, and that's made up of items reflecting reciprocity and coercion, which is highly relevant to, to welfare conditionality. So, so we know that our welfare system is conditional. That's not going to change anytime soon. What we want for the welfare system, and by the way, it's, if, when I talk to unemployed workers about the fact that the unemployed, that, that mutual obligations exist and it is conditional, that's generally not seen as necessarily always a bad thing. What people object to is the unfairness of it and the arbitrary nature of it. So if we're going to have a conditional system, it needs to be done fairly. Um, and this is an area, of, for example, we see, you know, we can see that, that individual providers are cogs in an unfair system and, and some caseworkers but um, try to do their best. But other case workers give the impression of enjoying their power quite a bit too much. Yeah. In other words, they're bullies. And there's a culture that either turns a blind eye or even supports it. And, and that's something the government could fix in a day. Simply say, there is no place for bullies in employment services and mean it and then follow through. So, so fairness is actually really important in a conditional welfare system. But any other system where your involvement is conditional, as a provider, you need to do that fairly. That's, yep. what, you, that's what your consumer wants. I'd probably point yep. out with that one, um, I think most people think it's fair to have a conditional welfare system, but work for the dole, I don't think is a <laughs> system no, that should it's, exist at all. Well, because it's, <laughs> not, it's, it's not doing what it's supposed to do. And I, I think one of the paradoxes is, you know, we talk about the employment services system being about there to help you get jobs. As I mentioned before, if you look at the advertising, you'd think that they're all there to, you know, they've got jobs coming out there is and they're going <laughs> to slot yeah. you into a great job tomorrow. That's what people go there hoping and wanting because who wants to be unemployed? It's not, yeah. not, a, not a pleasant experience for anyone. The reality is that that doesn't, is, that's not what's happening. Mm. So the same thing with fairness. People expect the welfare system to be conditional, but they expect it to be fair. When the reality is something quite different, that's pretty depressing and pretty disconcerting for people. A broader point I would make, I think, on um, fairness and conditionality is that in our um, entire economic system where the incentive is to keep the cost of labor as low as possible, um, I think a good argument for scrapping um, as much, if not all of the um, conditionality, is that that is where the capture will happen to try and bully people into accepting lower paid, lower condition work. That's right. If you make it so that welfare is as needed, so I need help, I need welfare, I get it, um, as David pointed out earlier, it gives you a lot more choice when uh, push comes to shove on if you take a job or not. It's good, it'll come down to whether you want it or not. I do think uh, there is quite a bit of um, political education to be done on linking welfare conditionality with general exploitation in, in employment um, in our society. But I certainly understand the the feeling a lot of people have given the brainwashing and the indoctrination that has happened on Dole Bludger's, the Dole Bludger narrative and <laughs> taxpayer money and all, all of that. I, I do think it's important to fight it because I think it's a really harmful narrative that goes to that sort of blaming welfare recipients for being poor as if it was a choice that they made. And often when you look at, um, like you could even think, oh, I could do this mutual obligation, that seems fair. 
think about the person who has those invisible conditions you cannot see, where they struggle with um, life circumstances, with all manner of things. And it just seems a feature of the system, not a bug at all, that the people who are doing it toughest cannot comply with these mutual obligations because they are just struggling to survive. So you actually bring up a really interesting point there, which is the relationship between the conditions under which this happens in the relationship with working conditions. And I think that the existence of a union from un for unemployed people is a really interesting thing in that space because there has, for a bit of uh, Australian politics, there is a conflict between the head union body in Australia, the ACTU, Australian Council of Trade Unions, and the Unemployed Workers Union. I don't think they recognise you as a union, do they? They... Um sort of give the game away when they make an argument from legalism that yes, <laughs> yes technically we cannot be um, a, a trade, therefore we can't um, apply to be a registered trade union, a registered organization. Legalism has been used to destroy union movements uh, since the very beginning, so it is extremely, extremely disappointing to see the AC2U do that. It is nonetheless entirely unsurprising, um, given that if you graph union membership over time, there is a straight line down from when they signed the accord and uh, basically yeah. sold out uh, worker organizing rights in, in exchange for a, a nice cushy deal with uh, business. And now you even get the Labour Party saying that they're, they're a, a business friendly party. Um, <laughs> yes. Some, some party of the workers. And they fucking... Yeah. They screw their own membership and organizing capacity by doing that shit. Even from the most yeah. corrupt point of view in that. like, If you drill into who Greens voters are, it's just left-wing Labour members who left. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's I like mean, you, I wouldn't you, say that entirely, yeah. but <laughs> I am one of those people. But <laughs> A large... That's true. There, there are also the... Um, <laughs> the tree Tories, shall we say? Yeah, the... Well, the... the <laughs> The people who uh, get the worst um, stereotype, yes, they do exist. Um, perhaps it would be more accurate for me to say um, most new Green supporters who weren't um, already there when it when the party began tend to be people who have left the Labour Party in disgust. And that's that's not to say, and it's good. It's good to point out that like. Um, you know, this is not to endorse or or support um, a given party. I think all party politics has incredible flaws, but it is an interesting pattern among the people who have recognised uh, what happened in the top brass of of the Labour Party and the trade union movement that has has uh, led directly to um, welfare payments being half the poverty line and wages being stagnated for decades in real terms. Yeah, for sure. So I'm going to haul us kicking and screaming back to this and say that <laughs> within this fairness factor, there are four questions in the survey. Yes. All right. Number four, shall we? So the fourth factor, and this was probably, we talked about this before, it's one of the most difficult ones to, to label. I've, I've labeled it as trustworthy, but it's a complex concept. Um, includes items associated with truthfulness as well as online servicing. And it detects a factor that relates to concerns about the loss of human and trusted services. It also reflects concerns about a service system that is primarily aiming to manage unemployed workers as throughputs and outcomes. And, and that's one of the challenges of when you have a provider who's different to the purchaser. Mm. or rather the purchaser is being different to the end user. So the purchaser is going to be concerned about throughputs and outcomes, whereas the end user is going to be concerned about the trustworthiness of, of this uh, of this service. So that's a reasonably complex concept. It, it is really important because when you have a purchaser, as, the, as is the government, operating as a monopsony, that is, you've got a single purchaser. So a monopsony is the opposite of a monopoly. In, the, in a monopoly, you've only got one provider. In a monopsony, you've only got one purchaser. Um, and the problems of monopsonies are almost, if not worse, than the problems of monopolies. Um, in that you end up with what's called double activation. You end up with the end user being activated through mutual obligations, but you also end up with the providers being activated 
What does activated mean here? Activated in in this space means people... So activation and mutual obligations are interchangeable terms. Okay. So, so activation may, is, is a philosophical assumption that if you're unemployed, you need to be activated to do something about not being unemployed. Right. So activation is a key feature of employment services, and, and that's a feature of employment services around the world. The thing when you have the purchaser being separated from the provider is the provider also becomes activated because if they don't follow through, they'll lose their contract. Yeah. So it, it's what it's called in the literature, double activation. Not just the unemployed workers are kind of being slapped around a bit by the system. Individual providers are also being slapped around by the system as well. And which is why we see things like the turnover rate of staff in employment services is about 40% per year, which is the national average, I think, is about 11%. Well, it might even be less than that from memory. This year's been a strange year to work out turnover rates because of, of COVID. But, but in a normal year, the, the average turnover rate for Australian industries is between 7 and 10% usually. So that's a really interesting thing for me to hear because one of the people I talk to about this and one of the people I talk to more generally about working within Centrelink staff actually worked as part of the like complaints management system within Centrelink. So they were employed mm -hmm. by the Australian government to deal with complaints about job service providers. Mm -hmm. They uh, have left that because they were so horrendously traumatized by the experience mm -hmm. that yes. they have wound up with basically PTSD. Sure. And there is... Oh my a, gosh. Yeah, it's real bad. And no small amount of that is because they can see just how awful and abusive this system is to the people within it. And like they see where these reward structures exist and where they do not exist. And I, I am curious if, if you know, were they in the Centrelink complaints line or the Department of Employment, Skills and Education? Um, actually, I might have got one of the E's around the wrong way. <laughs> That's um, a bit. That, that complaints line, because um, they're, they're two separate ones. And, I don't and one know of them, off the top of my head, sorry. Right, because one of them um, would potentially be dealing with people whose lives have now been fractured by their payment being cancelled, and that was their only means of subsistence. And that that is one of the truly traumatic um, parts of this system, is the punishment for non-compliance is starvation. actual starvation. Yeah. 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 <laughs> um, so I, I, I really feel... Um, for the uh, people who go into the public service wanting to do good and then are just molded into carrying out these violent policies of, of the government. Um, I, I do hope uh, your your friend uh, can can have some, some peace and time. Um, and, uh, you know, there's got to be some kind of, of reckoning in terms of where the accountability lies with the architects and profiteers of this system, because it's, I guarantee you, it's not the Serena Russos of the world. It's not the department yeah. secretaries of the world getting this, this traumatization. The, the, the kind of things about um, forced choice in, in our welfare system equally applies in employment. I mean, your friend, what was their choice? Not, not get a job. I mean, yeah, right. then they, they'd be in the same system too. I have, I have a lot of sympathy for the people who get um, asked to do these, these awful things and struggle with it because it, it really does show that, that, that they care and especially your friend quitting and, and, and feeling so awful about it. The, the main ire, I would hope, are the people who are, who are running, setting up, or not running, so who are, who are really setting up and, and profiting from these systems of oppression. The government ministers setting up these programs. Yeah. The, the, the monsters very highly, are definitely at the top, for sure. The highly salaried executives and then... God, all of the people who run these places for profit. Yes. There's been an interesting bit of literature recently where we, I think it came out of Queensland Uni, looking at we need to stop seeing that harm is an unintended consequence of some of these policies. We, ah, we probably yes. need to be saying harm is actually an intended consequence of some of these policies. But yep, let's go back absolutely. to the, the factors. So the yep. fifth factor. Sorry, real quick, what, there are eight questions within the Trustworthy section. Yep. So the fifth factor is, I've labelled it as being responsive to feedback. And, and what that does is it reflects the ease with which concerns about programs can be discussed and, and if those concerns are likely to be acted upon. So while most of the questions relate to complaints, it was intended to convey the purpose of a complaints mechanism, that is something's going to change as a result of making the complaint. Now, one of the interesting features, particularly around this one, 
is that not every program is going to have a necessitated complaint. And so one of the challenges around wording questions about things that are important but don't necessarily happen in every program is we had to put those statements as hypothetical statements. Yeah. So it was an if this happened, how comfortable do you feel or do you think this will happen as a result? So that's slightly different to an ex most experience surveys in that experience surveys are obviously asking about experience and we're asking about things that people haven't necessarily experienced. Nonetheless, those things are really important. So, you know, there was a dilemma about do we put them in because they're not going to happen to everyone or do we leave them out? But by leaving them out, we're leaving out something that's really, really important when it does happen. Yeah. So, so, so just particularly in that fifth factor, the wording of those statements is, is all hypothetical. Mm. And there were six questions in that. Section. Yes. Now, the sixth factor was labelled as friendly. It could have been called rapport, but because everything else was a verb, I wanted to, sorry, an adverb, I wanted to yeah. make it, <laughs> keep it consistent. Rapportful. <laughs> Rapportful didn't kind of work, so. <laughs> ah, back to the drawing board. <laughs> the items in this factor reflect rapport and relationship, and it, and it serves as an important reminder that employment services are a human service. And, and interestingly, this is the factor that generally scores the highest in most survey responses. I'm not convinced that we're useless, but we're really nice is yeah. necessarily a great strap line for, for a company. Well, I honestly think that's that was part of the strategy dreamed up in the 1980s was uh, a kind of uh, a friendlier rapport that... that oh, yes, was, the smiling uh, face on the boot. Yeah, exactly. Yes, yes. <laughs> So, so we, we, you know, we want all these other services, but we actually do want to have a relationship with people. You know, we're, we're humans, and we want to have a relationship with the person. Now, interestingly, since we've been trialing the the most recent version, we've asked for feedback about, you know, is the is the survey asking all the questions you think it should ask? And I think that there's one factor that is not covered in in this factor, which we possibly might add down the track, and that is frequent comments about turnover of caseworker right and and there's a there's a difficulty there in that people often mention that they go into their employment services provider one week and then the next week they've got a different person and then the week after they've got a different person again yeah and that is a significant issue now it's an issue in the industry because turnover is so high but but it's something that if the industry needs to improve then they need to really consider seriously about turnover now we haven't built that into the rating scale at the moment, but in terms of ongoing development, I think that relationship with you know, turnover of a single provider or, or some question around that is probably important. It's likely to end up under this factor, mm. but it also might end up under the trustworthy factor. And I'm not sure where it's going to end up. And that'll just be a question of what does it tend to cluster with? Because it could also be an element of trustworthiness. One thing I, I want to just riff on with the bringing up of the friendly um, face on the boot is sort of a, a theme that we see in all government programs that start off with, even if they um, you take them at their word that they've got good intentions, they end up just being the worst um, possible imagination of them. So what uh, many people don't know is that it was actually Keating who introduced mutual obligations to our welfare system. It was Howard who said, oh, but the public servants aren't really enforcing them because they don't want to ruin lives. What we'll do is we'll just disband the Commonwealth Employment Services <laughs> system. We'll outsource it to the private market because I know the private market would love to get their hands on welfare recipients and bully them. And that's exactly what happened. Yeah. And then we saw the cycle repeat, you know, 15 years later when Bill Shorten, um, literally Bill Shorten, introduces uh, data matching between the ATO and Centrelink uh, with, with human oversight, of course. And Scott Morrison then gets in there and says, oh, what if we just remove the human oversight? And oh, suddenly we've got robo debt and i'm um it's almost comical that bill shorten is now the minister to oversee the <laughs> robo debt royal commission yes i would love to see those terms of reference that preclude the the investigation into his role specifically yeah. he was also the one 
his fingerprints are all over it. This is how um, disgraceful of a human being he is. He was the one who um, started the class action for RoboDebt. And oh no, they settled pretty quickly. And a lot of people in that RoboDebt class action are very upset it wasn't properly litigated. Mm -hmm. And they were given peanuts instead of their justice and day in court. You can also see something similar happening with the NDIS as well. Hundred percent. And look, just shout out to all of the giants in in the in the movement who who did that incredible work on on robo debt. All of the people at Not My Debt. Um, someone who was quite active with um, AUW at the time and in in that campaign, spearheading that campaign. Asher Wolf did incredible work there. Um, and it's just it, it, it's just sad that these cycles keep repeating, and it all yeah. comes back to. As, as we uh, have, have touched on, these policy decisions that are given by ministers who very often do intend a specific harm for a specific ideological purpose. Yeah. Sure. Okay, moving on to the final factor. Just quickly, though, the friendly questions, the smiley face on the boot has eight yes. in that. The reason why there's so many in that section is that there were a lot of there were a lot of other surveys that had lots of questions around that. So that was kind of a, an artifact of the fact that there were so many other surveys that, that involve stuff around relationships and rapport. Mm. Now, the final factor, which came out of the second wave of data, which was labelled as realistic, some of those factors were originally under FAIR, but it, it, as I said, it split into two. So FAIR and realistic became two separate factors. And realistic is composed of items around job search expectations in relation to both the environmental factors like your location or whatever and also your personal factors so so what your capacity is to look for work now it's a complex factor because setting realistic expectations requires an understanding of the interplay between expectation and hope mm. and undue pessimism or optimism you know there's a, there's a thing in the literature that they call toxic optimism and it's a it's it's a great term which is when people say oh you know don't worry you'll be fine when you're falling apart yeah yeah, yeah. so so some optimism is good but some optimism can be quite toxic likewise undue pessimism can be fine but too much pessimism can really bring you down so so realistic even though it sounds obvious, it's actually quite a skill to get that setting right. Yeah. And in short, it requires extraordinary interpersonal skills on the part of the provider, which I'm sorry to say just doesn't happen. Yeah, for sure. Doesn't really seem to be existing much in employment and services. And isn't rewarded as well. Uh, absolutely. It isn't rewarded. I think there's only three or four in... in four. Four, yeah. And, and the reason why that's a reasonably small factor is because that split out of fair. There just weren't that many questions mm. associated with it. So they're the seven factors that seem to describe when an unemployment, unemployed worker says, this is what I want out of a service. These are the qualitative dimensions that they're talking about. One of the really interesting things that came up in the research paper, which will be referenced in the notes for the people who want to go and read it, mm. is that you had at least one person in your uh, early survey, uh, like the, the pilot surveys, who said that until they did the survey, they had no idea what job service providers were actually supposed to be doing for them yes. or how they were supposed to be treated. That was one person that said that quite explicitly, but it was a common theme that what we're talking about, and it's kind of, this is an optimistic kind of thing in that I'm saying this is what a good provider can look like. And let's work on the assumption, might be naive, but let's work on the assumption that we can, it's within human capacity to provide a good service. This is not about saying all services are really shit and they should disappear forever. This is about saying if we're going to have employment services and we want them to be good, this is what a good service looks like to an unemployed worker. Yeah. So I suppose in some respects, it's looking at what they say they do on paper and saying, okay, what would Precisely. that look like? And it gets back to that thing I was saying at the very beginning, that if we're talking about employment services having three, not mutually exclusive, but three interbalanced functions, what this survey does is really kind of focus on on that balance of, of yeah. those three functions. So for the provider, it's juggling all of those balls in the air at the same time. Yeah. Now, that's not beyond human capacity. No, but it's certainly uh, 
not supported in the system that exists, yeah. And it requires some skill. Mm. So each of the questions in each of these sections is built around what you mentioned before called the Likart scale, or Likart, depending on who you ask about the pronunciation. Yeah, yeah. Well, Mr. Likart says Likart. Yep. So what these look like is that you have some statement, for example, uh, in factor six, question seven is my provider is respectful. And all of these are stated in a positive way. So th the statement read, and if you agree with it, it's representing a positive interaction. Then you have five options. So you have strongly disagree, which gets a numerical value of one. You have disagree, which gets a numerical value of two. You have neutral or neither agree nor disagree, which gets a value of three. You have agree, which gets four, and strongly agree, which gets a five. So with the positive uh, writing of the statement, that means a five points, or a bigger number, is associated with a generally more positive experience. Mm -hmm. So there's a consistency there, and it happens across all of the questions, and that makes all of your numerical stuff much easier to do. Hmm. Now, because I am incredibly picky about these things, I think it's worth having a conversation about using numbers to represent with a very variable and very personal experience. The Likart scale responses stated as a disagree, agree, whatever, have an ordering, which goes from most opposed to the statement to most aligned with the statement. But we run into very real problems when it comes to measuring distance or even making meaning of distance. Numbers have the structure where the distance between one and two is the same as the distance between two and three or four or five or pick your consecutive numbers. But the same can't really be said of opinions. We have no real way to justify that for a particular person on a particular question, the distance, in my head this is kind of intensity of feeling, between strongly disagree and disagree is the same as between disagree and neither or any of the others. It's very difficult to compare across questions for a single person, and it's even harder to compare between people for a question or across different questions. Let me be very clear to any STEM bros who have somehow stumbled in here. This doesn't mean what a Likart scale is trying to do and trying to measure is invalid. It just means that numbers can be a very bad tool to use when it comes to dealing with the underlying structure, because opinions and human experience are considerably more complex than these numbers really reflect. David, in your research, uh, you had choices to make. So why did you choose a Likart scale for these responses? Okay, so that's a good question. It's a hard one too, sorry. <laughs> uh, well, it's, yes, it is a hard one. And, and partly I ch chose a Likert scale because people are familiar with it. You could have used yeah. things like a visual analog scale where you get people to rate, you know, one to 10 along a, a line or, or something like that. Essentially what you're trying to do is turn something that is qualitative into a quantitative way so that you can manipulate it. Now, another way of dealing with that is to simply just put strongly agree and disagree as yes, put neither, get rid of that number, and have um, a, all the people who said agree and strongly agree as no, so that you've just turned it into a, um, a, binary. a binary thing. And that's also perfectly valid to do. What you're trying to do is represent a qualitative component into a numerical thing. And I guess um, there's enough um, history to using Likert scales to say, yes, we know that it's not pure in that the average of strongly disagree or the average of disagree and neither isn't disagree and a half. Yeah. Uh, but what it does is it provides some some reflection of some internal process where someone who's talking about their respectful provider, someone who's rating their provider as strongly disagree or a one, is probably having a different experience to someone who's rating their provider as a five or strongly agree. So you're trying to reflect people's experiences and you're trying to absolutely reduce people's experiences into a way that you can manage the data. It's yeah. We don't want the perfect to become the enemy of the good in, in this instance. So it's, it's not perfect. 
I guess some of the decisions around, you know, the choice of a five-point Likert scale, you know, I've seen seven-point or four-point or, or whatever, five-point seems to be a, a, the most commonly used number in, in Likert scales. I've seen Likert scales that are just one, two, three. You don't tend to get that much great data out of one, two, three Likert scales. Well, there's a loss of precision Absolutely. in that respect, yes. But then, you know, when you go to, say, 7-point or even 10-point Likert scales, you get so much precision. Yeah, it's, no it's just noisy. It's just noise. So 5 is kind of the, the Goldilocks number. You know, some a lot of Likert scales are either 4 or 5. Um, there's some discussion about whether 3 is a valid number because particularly if you don't have a not applies uh, and there yeah. is no not applies in this survey. So three might also be uh, doesn't apply. Mm. One of the problems with a four point Likert scale is that there's that no... That is one that excludes this option. Exactly. And, and it excludes the opportunity to say, look, you know, I don't really have a, I don't have a view. My preference is for five point scales. It's kind of the balance between enough precision and enough data to kind of play with. But as I said, we can we can knock it down to just a simple binary yes, no, and, and that certainly happens in some research. I also chose five because so many rating scales these days are five stars sort of stuff. You know, it's it's a topic that we have become so familiar with over the last ten or twenty years that most people kind of know how a five point scale works. So, so five is kind of the has become by default pretty standard uh, Likert scale. In fact, when you when you set up a a survey on on Qualtrics, it defaults to five because that's what most people use. So, once you've got some number of responses to this, you actually went through a validation process to make sure that what you were doing in this survey was valid. So, you got. Uh, responses that aligned with what you would expect to see in the circumstances that those responses described. What was that like? Okay, so so once we we tested, as I say, about 170 unemployed workers, what I then did was say, okay, are these factors still clustering together? So instead of what we call exploratory factor analysis, it was confirmatory factor analysis. And, and so what you're doing is saying, are these questions all still clustering together as I'm expecting them to do. So instead of going in with without a theory, I'm going in with a theory saying, this is my theory, I'm expecting to see this, are these things going to cluster together? Now the other thing with a survey is you can have, and I, the name's just gone out of my head, I'm sorry, but there's two types of surveys. One is where all the subscales feed into an overall score, and then there's others where subscales kind of stand on their own. Now in this one, the subscales actually do stand on their own, but I'll talk about how why we have put them together into one number. There's a, there's a problem with doing that. Oh, we're about to get to that, don't we? Yes. <laughs> but again, coming back to people's experience of rating scales, we're kind of being influenced by the fact that that's what people are expecting to find. Yeah. So each of the subscales is, if you like, a standalone rating. So someone who scores well on, say, friendliness doesn't necessarily score well on, on usefulness. They're, they're independent variables, yep. not influencing each, each other. So a total score from the whole survey doesn't necessarily reflect the same thing. So someone might get, say, three stars because they've done well on some questions and they haven't done well on other questions. Another provider might get three stars as well. Because they're basically average across everything. Yes. Yeah. The downside to that is it kind of blunts the whole thing into to a bottom line. But we, we, we understand that people are busy. They just want to, you know, just tell me what it is. But we've also made sure that, as I said before, the individual responses to each question are also there. So that if people want to drill down to, into it, and some people will, um, they can drill down into it literally question by question. Now, we're also hoping that providers will drill down into it question by question. So, for example, if provider finds, you know, provider X finds that they're consistently being rated as bad on respectful, that's going to have an interesting conversation in the staff room about, <laughs> well, what do we have to do to behave more respectfully to our um, unemployed workers here? 
Yeah. So let's actually talk about that、uh, averaging process.、Mm. So once you have a bunch of responses, the next step is to collate them into some kind of overall score system for a given provider.、Mm. This, as you say, happens at multiple levels. So the first level is for a given question, you will take some average of all the responses to that question. So I believe this was done as a mean. Yes. So for the question, we get the、uh, we're going to call this f j k bar. Sorry for the. Sudden mathematical notation, but in this case, J is the question number、mm -hmm. and K is the factor number. Yep. So you,、uh, what we saw before, for example, was F、uh, seven six or something. Yeah. So that would be question seven in factor six.、Mm. All right. So this becomes the sum of responses divided by the number of responses. Yep. So that happens at the individual level. For each question,、mm -hmm. from there, these get combined into an average for each factor, yes, and then an average overall score.、Mm. So the factor average, I believe, was taken as a mean of the question. So for your factor mean, this is going to be f bar k. So the average for the factor based on each questions. This becomes the sum of the question means divided by the number of questions. And here we introduce a bit of a, a, a like a, a judgment, a value thing, because this treats each question within a factor as equally important. Correct. Or in a more like pedantic sense, this says that there is not a reason to justify one question being more or less important than the other. We call this equally weighted as well. That's correct. From here, there are two ways to go to an overall average score. You can treat each factor as equally important. Or treat indi each individual question as equally important. We're going to go through what those mean. What the first of those look like is that your overall factor, your overall score, your f bar total, I suppose, is the sum of the factor means divided by the number of factors. So seven in this case.、Mm. This is slightly different to what we will see when we look at individual questions. So this looks like one on seven times f one bar plus one on seven times F two bar and up to one on seven times F seven bar. I know I've done twenty episodes of this show, but what does the bar mean again? Okay, sorry. So this is indicating that you have an average. Oh, okay. So as opposed to writing、uh, F seven, which is the seventh factor, you put a bar over it to indicate that you've taken an average for that. Yeah. The second one is to have F bar is equal to the sum. Of the question means divided by the total number of questions. To see why these are different, let's look at a really, really simple example. So we're going to have two factors A and B. A is going to have two questions in it. B is going to have three. So our mean for A is going to be A one plus A two on two. Our mean for B. Is going to be B one plus B two plus B three on three because there's three of them.、Mm. Like if you write this another way, you get a half times A one plus a half times A two, and this over here becomes a third times B one plus a third times B two plus a third times B three. The mean of the averages is then so this is going to be our f bar, which is A bar. Plus b bar on two, which,、uh, if we write this out, what we get is a half times well this thing in here. So one half a one plus one half a two plus this in here. So a third b one plus a third b two plus a third b three. We can multiply these fractions out, so this is going to be really long. Sorry, so you get a quarter because it's a half times a half, a one, and a two. But you get a sixth for the b's. So that's a sixth times b one plus a sixth times b two plus a sixth times b three. In this situation. Each question in A has more of an impact on the overall mean score than each question in B, although the factors A and B overall contribute equally. If instead you go by equally weighted questions, you get F bar is equal to well, there's five questions, so it's one on five plus each question A one plus A two plus B 
plus b2 plus b3. So they each get this factor of 1 on 5 instead of 1 on 4 for the a's and 1 on 6 for the b's. This is kind of a, a question of where you put your weights. Do you weight each factor as equally important to the overall score, or do you consider each question as equally important to the overall score? So, David, which averaging process did you use? Well, that's a good question, and um, I'll have to actually check with Daniel, but I think we used... Um, Daniel can... I can, I, I can just clarify, yeah. Um, look, I, I had my um, questions about this as well, but it, it's tempered by the fact that I can go in and change it at any time um, if yep. we find we should be weighting them differently. It is a pure arithmetic mean. So each each question, there's 44 questions in the rating scale. There's four supplementary that aren't included in the scale. Um, so the, four, the 44, it's literally score out of five, um, sum them, and then divide by 44. Okay, so, the, so yeah. you use this where each individual question is equally weighted. Hmm. Yes. Okay, so what that does mean is that each factor is no longer equally weighted. Yeah. That means that the factors which have more questions in them get, I guess, more of a share of the overall importance than the factors that have fewer questions in them. That's exactly right. And thanks for drawing that to our attention. I think that's a conversation we actually haven't had properly. Yeah. So real quick, I'm just going to go back to here. So we can actually look at this and we can say that, okay, so in this case, fair and realistic, which have the fewest number of questions, have the um, least weighting when it comes to that overall score. Sure. And historically, the reason why it's got, you know, in, ideally, I wanted the, all the factors to have a similar number of questions. Yeah. And when fair and realistic were, in fact, one, one um, factor, you know, the weight rating was getting close. Mm. So this also comes into something you said quite early on, which was that useful was the most important Hmm. Quest was the most important factor. It does, in fact, have the most weight. Well, it's one of three that have equally the most weight. But I don't think you've chosen that to correspond to an actual consideration of useful no. as the most important thing. At this point in in the development of the scale, we're we're not that sophisticated yet. Yeah, yeah, for sure. <laughs> to be able to say, well, which of these are in fact, you know, is there a weighting to some of these factors? You know, down the track we might be able to get to that point. Mm. Uh, at this point in the development of a scale, we are just going with keep it simple, keep it basic, yep. but also making sure that it's also pretty transparent mm. how we're getting to this. Because, you know, if it were just some sort of secret algorithm... Oh, yeah, you don't have to tell anyone. You can do it every time. <laughs> and we could. We could just write a secret algorithm and just say to a provider, well, you know... You've got two stars, full stop. Yeah. No, I think the transparency is very important, yes. While we are still, and probably not just while, but as an ongoing thing, this is going to continue to be a pretty transparent process because, as I've mentioned at the beginning, it's got to be useful for providers to do something. Yes. We actually want them to read this detail. You know, the fact that we've put them in clusters and label them, well, you know, that's nice and that's useful. But telling a provider, for example, that they're they're not fair, well, what are you going to do with that? Mm. But if you actually explain, well, not fair means doing this, this, this and this, it actually gives them some behavioral things to do about. So so the algorithm will will never be secret and hidden because yeah. it's it's this is an example where the sum is not really greater than the, the, the parts. Yeah. It's the parts that are actually much more useful here. Yeah. Yeah. And, and at present, we don't have enough data per location for the algorithm really to yet matter. Yeah. And it is a flick of a button on my end to just amend the formula when we do the processing. And I've built it that way specifically for that reason. Every time we recompute the, the ratings, it crunches through all the data again so that any changes um, are made at, at a top level. I don't have to have that pain in my life. <laughs> well, one interesting thing about this, uh, we've actually looked at some weighting of averages before. We looked at some when we were talking about a really quite bizarre uh, Bloomberg rating of countries in their ability to respond to COVID, which uh, was a very surreal episode. We've also looked at them in calculation of the consumer price index, because that is an average of change in costs that is weighted by the proportion that people spend on each of the different sectors. Mm. So your housing costs, your food costs, your transport have different weightings based on what survey respondents say they put into each thing. 
And in something like this, how you would develop a justification to say, we will weight these things unequally if you decide to do that, is you go and you talk to the people who would do the survey and you say, which of these things do you think is the most important? Mm. Which of these things has the biggest impact on your like experience of using these services? So at this point in its development, and, and I'm not even sure that we're going to ever get to a point where we can just collapse this down into some single number. Well, you'd still want all that detail available. Like, you it's you useful. absolutely want that detail, not just available, but, but quite explicit. Yeah. On that point, the intention is to very shortly make all of this data available in open source spreadsheets that anyone mm. can dig through and draw their own conclusion. Obviously, it'll be completely de-identified of the people who gave the responses. I'm talking about the aggregation per provider. Yeah. Well, I'd actually like to talk about the sampling process first for a bit and then look at the uh, web app and the stuff that's happening now with it. This survey, the initial stuff w that was in that research paper was done with participants from the Australian Unemployed Workers Union. Hmm. And in the discussion in that, David, you said that this may bias the responses to be generally more negative towards job service providers. So this is what we call a convenience sample because you talk to the people that were available and then have a think about what may make some more likely to respond and respond in a particular way. Yes. When we go to something that is publicly available, uh, so on online, are you seeing, this is kind of a question for both of you, I suppose, are you seeing a change in the typical responses? At, at the moment, not yet. Okay. The data that started to come in in the last few weeks with, with this seems to be pretty consistent. In fact, I did run some numbers. It's consistent to 0.01. The Ooh. first... Yeah, the first 240 responses had an average score of 2.002. Ah. The the latest 130 since we pushed the display app live are an average of 2.015. Are you also able to look at the variance in those? Not at present. No. Okay, because I, would have I to set up something for that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So one of the um, so this kind of runs into an issue of treating these as numbers rather than as like actual experiences. But mm. if you are looking at the numbers and you are wanting to look at how consistent it is, you do need to look at the variance as mm. well as the like mean. Because uh, one thing you may find, and I think we talked about this before, about how useful is an average overall, is that something that looks like this, so it's called bimodal, it has peaks here and here, would have the same average as something that looks like this. Yes. But these are very, very different behaviours. This one will have a much higher variance. Hmm. Mm. But uh, when, they, when you run into issues there with uh, privacy of the people responding to the questions? Could you elaborate on what you mean by that? So he did say that they were anonymized, as in you don't get any data about who submitted which responses. But if you um, if you factor for variance in that regard, wouldn't you um, run into, like, as in who's a member and who's not, for example, you would be able to uh, sort of uh, backdate the identifying data? So this is something you would do at the aggregate level. So you would, like, yeah. measure the variance within each question overall, and that just spits out a number. It doesn't tell you which particular um, responses are aligned to which group of data. Yes, okay. Yeah. So, so we haven't done any detailed analysis yet of whether this latest cohort is significantly different, you know, whether we've got the top top graph or the bottom graph to the to the cohort that we've done before. That's that's obviously something to, to look at. Now we're starting to get some new new data in. Yeah, so one of the things I wanted to talk about with that is you guys have a web app that this survey now feeds into. Could you tell me, well, tell us and particularly our audience, what it is and what it does or is intended to do for end users, so people who are interfacing with the Centrelink system? I can do that. I was momentarily distracted because I can actually crunch those factor numbers that you <laughs> when I was, I was starting to do it. But look, I'll, I'll, um, I'll, I'll come to the question instead. Um, Mr. Speaker, no. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that awkward phrasing. Um, do I get a gavel? I won't gavel. <laughs> I think so. Um, so the, the whole point of this app, at the very, at the very least, has to be to finally give a voice en masse to the people being brutalized in this system. If it does nothing else, I would love for people to at least feel heard, feel not alone, and that um, th they can tell someone about this. Because probably one of the most um, awful experiences you can have is ringing the complaints line, filing your complaint, never hearing about it again. 
calling them up. They'll say, oh, we looked into it. And no agency that we know of has ever been sanctioned. No one's ever had their license taken away for the, the brutality that they visit on people. However, we would like to go further. We've already had people on social media um, have some great ideas about the different things we can do with all of this data. We are now getting a very clear picture of who are the absolute worst providers. We might go into this a little bit later, but uh, we've got some pretty large data samples now on some of these providers and just how bad they are. So what do you consider a large sample here? We have 62 responses cool. for APM employment. It's a, it's a single chain. Yeah. And their average rating is 1.9. Cool. So uh, out of five. <laughs> yeah. So real quick on that structure. So you could have, you said a, a chain. So this means that this is a particular company that has a bunch of different branches in different locations. Yes. And you are aggregating what's happening across those different branches to the single company. Yeah, exactly. I just quickly whipped up um, for the uh, questions that you had a response um, to location ratio. So how many responses we've got to how many locations a chain has. And it tends to correlate actually, uh, oh no, I shouldn't, I shouldn't say that. Um, <laughs> I, I can't pull out a, a correlation, but what I could see qualitatively at the top of the data is a large number of responses to locations for the worst providers. Yeah, right. With uh, one with one outlier for a company that's only got one location. So obviously their response to location ratio is um, quite high. Yeah. Yeah. So yes, the the the, the point being um, in in total about like the the intention of of the app. It's um, beyond giving people a voice. I think it would be twofold. One is to submit lengthy reports about how bad the entire system is to the department to say it should be scrapped. If you want to do employment services, um, throw it out, page one, rewrite, try again. We would point them to the Commonwealth Employment Service, which worked so well for so long, where the intention was to actually help people rather than give uh, fat contracts to uh, private companies. But the second thing, which is the thing that we can do right now, if the government is hesitant to end the business model of some of its largest donors, if you uh, look at, at um, how many of these corporations uh, donate to both the Labour and Liberal parties, it is sickening. Uh, so we are not actually optimistic that they will do this. What we can do is hopefully leverage the ability to change providers in this system and get people to um, switch away from the worst ones. Mm. We would think at some point, if we can find a chain or if we, if we are aware of a chain that is wholly um, resistant to the feedback on how they are affecting people, we would probably at some point encourage a boycott of that chain and we would be able to, through the app, um, highlight them in a special color, give people instructions for how to change, and then they can feel the full force of the, of the market as was originally intended <laughs> by the government with the AUWU once again doing the government's job uh, for them. And uh, one thing I like to joke to myself about is if I had built um, the level of, of sophistication and detail in this app for the jobsearch.gov.au website and that had been sanctioned by the department, I'd be looking at a payday of millions of dollars. So um, Desi, get at me if you want that invoice. <laughs> I'm so. And also as a union organizer, it must be ha handy to have this data because you can... Uh... Oh, that's a good a point. Hot spots so people are... we've been through a bit of a restructure of late and... Yeah, it's funny you mentioned that. I guess you'll be the first to hear of this outside of the committee of management. We are planning to train site delegates because we will have access to all of this data. We can direct people to a person who will um, be able to keep track of the qualitative stories at their locations, areas, sites, that kind of that kind of thing. Because as as David's um, sort of pointed out, the numbers really do need to be informed by what those numbers mean qualitatively. So it's one thing to just aggregate all of this data. And then the next thing is, and so what? It's a cool, it's a cool tech tool. It's kind of nothing without the involvement of people advocating for system change and, and improvement to conditions. I have pulled up the uh, app and we'll go and have a look at your wall of shame. So these are the uh, people who have the worst overall company, company scores. Yes. And like, so you give a number of ratings. So this is your sample size. You have um, the average for each of the factors that's available here. And these are additional factors. They're not part of the scale. No. Okay. Yep. And then if I go to that particular um, company, I can see, uh, so the number of subsidiaries, what does that mean? 
that means they don't have any franchises underneath them. Some of these places will have like different offshoots for say like parents next versus disability right, employment okay. services some of them will all be under the same um, umbrella um most of them don't have subsidiaries but some of the bigger ones have so many that it needed a sort of a franchise structure and yeah. the original um format of the app had a franchises tab but there weren't enough to justify it so i've just got um you can click into if they've got a sub if you um click out and go back to to the thing if you scroll down to coact um, which is all the way at the bottom. They're actually doing relatively well. Um, you can see that they've got, you can see they've got yeah, a 17. number of, they've got 17, exactly. So oh, and they're all listed here. Okay. It was exactly, it was an interesting thing of like, how do I display this data? Because yeah. an entity is different. So if you click through the number of subsidiaries, there's an icon there that has, yep, you can click through and you can see this. Oh, each individual one. Yes. And it yeah. looks like you can do that for the particular location. Exactly. Too? Yes. Okay, yep. And yeah. Uh, let's go have a look. Oh, no, that is not yet rated. So this is uh, one. Okay. And this has, so you have number of ratings, number of comments. So comments are free text. Comments are the um, comments we scraped from the job search website. We are okay. obviously quite cognizant of the fact that um, these entities can be um, fairly protective of their cash cow. Yeah. So we were not willing to open a free reign comment section. However, the government... Um, the one, the one <laughs> good part of the job search website was they have comments. So yep. I made a little crawler to go and take all of those comments and we've republished them here. Yep. Um, so you've got, that's an eye okay, opener. Okay. So you've got the average for each individual thing, the additional factor, and then the score for particular, uh, yes. questions here as well. It's available. It's really useful. So this is kind of the very raw data and you And if going... you scroll down to the end, you can see my, uh, something I've got to fix in the spreadsheet, which is that's. Um, listed to two decimal places, and it should yeah, just be the rest. Of, <laughs> yeah, <this> is, <laughs> no, don't worry. Uh, decimal places are the bane of my existence, <laughs> especially in marking. Thankfully, it doesn't affect the accuracy. It just looks a bit weird. So, um, if we go all the way back, if okay, so if somebody wants to submit a rating, how do they go about that? Uh, so. They would go to their location uh, that they want to rate. There's two ways, actually. They can just go onto the website and go to the type form and, and click from the drop down. But if you go to any of your locations, so you can get it through the map or you can get okay, it through the service rating step. Yep, pick up this pick one. Up yep. them. And then there's a rate the service right. button. Oh, yeah, right excellent. There. That comes up. And, okay, yep. so it opens the thing as yep. a new window. Okay. And if you look up at the top in the URL, it pre fills um, your site. Okay. Your yep. site. Yeah. All right, that, excellent. That took way more time than I wanted it to, but <laughs> <laughs> got there in the end. Um, Look, it happens, right? <laughs> it's, it was the adage of um, when something works seamlessly, you don't see what happened in the background to make it work. Yep. And it was just me up at 3 I'm going, ah, how do I make this API fit together? Yeah, um, yeah, for sure. So uh, this also means that if you are living in a particular area, you can go to your area and have a look at what's available around you and potentially move to one that has a better rating. Yeah, that, that would be the um, ideal outcome if the system weren't to change. At the very least, helping people avoid the locations that would ruin their lives and yeah. go to one who would, as David put it, be be useless, but at least kind. That, 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 <laughs> that, <laughs> yes, right. that unfortunately is the ideal outcome in this in incredibly awful system. Yeah. So other than making the more detailed data available, what have you got next lined up for this? That's the point I was just making before about um, this tool is um, fine. It's it's uh, it's cool, but it's nothing without the involvement of people in a campaign. Yeah, we've already had a lot of excitement about what this will mean for coordinating and organizing those campaigns. I wouldn't really preempt what that's going to look like. We've got. Um, I, I would encourage people who want to get involved um, like this, especially any of the people in the audience who have data science and technical backgrounds. I, I would love extra help there, but people who also want to oh, get just well, involved. Well, my consulting is available. <laughs> <laughs> Look, the, the more desperate I get, the closer <laughs> I get to needing to deliver something, I'll think about it. But, um, <laughs> I'll do it pro bono if I get a publication. <laughs> hmm. <laughs> Funny you should mention that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, really? Well, you have my email. So. <laughs> in, in, in any case, um, pork barreling of our own aside. <laughs> the next move, I guess, uh, post this election where we feel we do have the capability to pressure this incoming government to do something meaningful to address mm. these incredible problems is we're running... Um, uh, we've got a pipeline coming up of a lot of organizing, training, planning, and campaigning to, um, yeah, it, this is this is not going to stand alone. It's just this is an online website where everything is. If you look at what this app is called, 
resources, organizing, advocacy, and rallying. Uh, yeah. We can push notifications to this app. We can have news alerts, things like that. Uh, we very much intend this to be as interactive as the person using it wants it to be. And we'll, we'll, we're certainly looking to um, make sure that the worst actors in this in this system feel acute pressure for what they're doing to people, and the politicians responsible feel acute pressure to stop letting these um, entities bully people without recourse. Yes, well, if there's a picket line, I will hopefully be on it. Now, the other thing, when you said, but wait, there's more, uh, there is more. One of the things we haven't mentioned is that the employment services system is changing on the fourth of July. A lot of providers are actually shutting down and new providers are coming online. One of my favorite things was um, building into this. I can literally just line item um, when, when I um, get all the full data. I line item, change the category, um, deactivate the ones and go push and all the ones that are inactive go inactive, all the ones that are new go go live. I was so happy when I did that. Oh, beautiful. <laughs> so, so Job Active is going to become Workforce Australia, which will be a combination of digital servicing and you know when you think of the Australian government and algorithm and vulnerable people <laughs> what could Nightmare possibly fuel, what yes. could go wrong there <laughs> for those who are deemed vulnerable by the department they will continue to have face-to-face uh, -face services from an employment provider. Some of the providers in the system now will disappear. There'll be new providers coming in. One of the really useful things that this data will be able to show is if this new system, which is supposed to be friendlier and nicer and more targeted and more capable, if the, if the ratings are consistent before and after, we have a really clear built-in pre-test, post-test mm -hmm. between the old system and the new system. And the other thing is because we've established reasonable credibility in terms of validity of the scale, we can then actually talk about what the scale says rather than whether the scale is is useful yeah. useful or not. We've, we've, we've done the hard work there. So now we can actually talk about what the scale says rather than arguing about whether the scale tells you something or not. The scale does tell you something and we'll be able to be able to go to the government and say, look, this new system was supposed to be better. And guess what? It would be nice it's to be not, able to say, yeah. <laughs> guess what? It is better. Or guess what? It's not better. Um, and this is where it's not better. One thing you can't see yet on the app, but um, is very easy to do, and I've already tested it, is go back to the wall of shame. Uh... That is already a slice of the data. We make sure we to to not get like the outliers of one response. That's filtered by um, only five ratings or more. Um, right. It is also very easy to filter that by date. So we can have snapshots yes. over time. Yeah. We could do week to week. We could do month to month with just a small amount of, of fiddling. And that is definitely the plan is to show what's happening over time. And especially where what David's talking about, where we get in touch with these providers and say, hey, you're really harming people. Uh, how about you not? Shape up. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we, want, we want you to do better. We can see if they, if they have a, an improvement. Um, I'm not so optimistic because I think... Um, it's central to their profit model to do this and get as, as many outcome payments as possible for as much squeezing as possible. But I am I'm always happy to be pleasantly surprised, as Peter <laughs> Khalil would put it. Well, I am actually going to put a, a bit of a, a teaser in here for the listening audience who are perhaps not subscribed to the channel. Uh, we are actually going to do an episode about the upcoming uh, Workforce Australia system because it has a whole additional structure of like you have to accrue points jumping through these particular hoops in an automated system which is one of the most evil statistical constructions i have seen in a very long time mm -hmm. so we are going to be talking to somebody who um knows the system who has worked uh within like the dese dc i can't remember what the ac exact acronym is and is able to talk us through the decision process and how that is likely to affect people so that will be coming out at some point in the future, keep your eyes peeled. That is very interesting. And we are turning our attention to formulating um, some kind of study into the new system because we'll get, because everyone will be experiencing the same system, we'd be able to get a lot of data quickly. One of the problems with this is um, it varying over the different providers. 
Um, and David's done such a good job of capturing um, that with, with the survey. Um, David, I, maybe you talk about the differences now for the centralized online services. And Well, what I am actually going to say is that we've been here for two hours. <laughs> wow. So, <laughs> so I would love to have you back on to talk about that uh, centralized yes. system once we've got that out and got more uh, information on that. But for the minute, thank you so much for coming on board. I'm really excited to see what happens with this. Thank you. I'm, I'm just shocked. It's a Friday night. What else is there to do but talk stats into it? <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, you see, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do the slightly differently nerdy thing of crack open a couple of cans and play a tabletop game where I can oh, be a druid. Nice. Yes. You forgot the pizza. <laughs> Not yet. I'm about to go and get the pizza. I, I love this discussion. These were great questions. Tess, thank you for having thank me you. on. It's been wonderful to have you both. Thank you very much. And Bart, thank you again for uh, being the voice in my ear. As ever. <laughs> All right. And uh, I'll see you next time, Bart. See you then.